we could actually make it better, better and better, build upon there's that collaborative core of, okay, we're, we're trying to share the, the revenue more among the co-op cooperative, but at the end of the day, it's still this consortium, a proprietary consortium that does not share its design or its economic know-how to exterior players. It's still the same kind of competitive thing, but there's definite potential in it. Um, so, I, yeah, I see that a lot, like a lot of these cooperatives say that, but they're, like, my critique of that is a lot of times it's like, okay, but where's the open source collaborative part, you know? And even in a... I, I, I agree it's not there, but I think that... The tools are needed to be created like specific efforts where that's kind of like that was the notion of this summer of extreme design build and apprenticeship like how we start generating uh, various assets that help move that along whatever structures whether it's like DAOs or um, I mean modern tools of modern economics um, or, or collaborative marketing assets or whatever uh, based on a very deliberate effort to to get to the products products across the board could be anything um, specifically towards like making stuff better like why aren't all cars like running on hydrogen with water lubricated engines that's a complete technol technological feasibility in fact there's a modern steam engine out there that that uh, is water lubricated high performance state-of-art stuff and it's like oh well that doesn't pollute, doesn't dribble oil, it does uh, I mean it still uses traditional fuels because the hydrogen economy is not, not here, but I mean we could be really knocking out problems like this environmentalism or resource depletion and stuff like that. So that's the higher call out, but it's very difficult for somebody to see that un until um, they kind of understand the, the raw power of productivity that humans have developed and that that uh, that's that should be made like the central focus of people's energy could be that we're actually trying to share that make it go forward and bring everybody up across the board so it's a mindset issue it's it's um, that would lead us to yes there could be more people doing this and creating those collaborative tools but yes just like we have the you know the the IPO or the notion of the corporation or limited liability or this or that that's in the modern modern economic system well those are all kind of structures dedicated to creating the kind of system we have right now but yes we need the alternatives to that uh, so that's all worth developing and it's a sad sad lack of them but I think you know things are coming out looks like things are coming out yeah, I mean, they're, they're, so that's like fintech, this, that's financial innovation where somehow you're able to incentivize large amounts of people to collaborate. I mean, that's the kind of theme we've been talking about all summer, like how do you really incentivize a whole bunch of people, how do you reward them? I mean, that's some real heavy thinking and, and experience and practice that has to go into it. It's not somebody on Wall Street that, that's going to do it. You're going to have to have more motivation, like, and also like a good understanding of like what's possible uh, through open collaboration. So, um, yeah, a lot of potential there. Uh, and once again, it's up to us to, to create that. So I'll say just with regard to the uh, collaborative literacy, so in looking at the resources on the wiki, right? Yeah. I think there are a number of pages which are helpful. There's Hold on, the collaborative me... literacy page, there's the OSC collaboration protocol. I don't know here. Hold on, hold on. Oh, um, okay, yeah. sorry, that was a bunch of noise. Sorry, go ahead. So if, if, uh, if I'm sitting here saying I want to be the most effective uh, OSC collaborator mm -hmm. I can, then I see that there are about five pages here that are pretty helpful. One, the collaborative literacy. Two, OSC collaboration protocol. Three, wiki instructions. Four, OSC specifications. And then five, the OSC crash course. Now this yeah. is, that's probably like three or four yeah. days worth of sitting in front of a computer oh, yeah. to get through all that material and to get up to speed, right? Oh yeah. So I guess my question is, and 
I have not had the chance to go through all of that since we met yesterday or since mm-hmm. we were out of the shop last night. So I guess the big question would be, is there a crash course that's helpful? <laughs> what's, the most, what's the most helpful thing we can do in the next hour, <laughs> right? <laughs> or is my best bet to just spend the time between now and lunch going through information, getting up to speed on this, and then spend the afternoon in the shop when it's warmer? <laughs> all right, that's it. Yeah, I mean, the... When we were on our walk, I said, it's like, man, it takes a lot of time and effort to get that. I don't think there's a crash course. You can give somewhat of a crash course, but there's a lot of layers from the philosophical to the practical executability part, the basic tools. There's principles, there's approach, there's practice. Before the principles even is philosophy, so it's philosophy, principles, an approach and then practice so like three levels three levels but you kind of have to get savvy on all of them but I think the most useful if we're actually getting into the shop and collaborating it's well here's how we just develop using wikis and open editable docs and open software tools like CAD focusing around the lowest skilled lowest skill level requirements rapid onboarding of people to do collaborative CAD like Collaborative CAD doesn't really exist. The way it typically works is locking down files. We're trying to do something different through our workflow. But at the end of the day, it's like, um, how do you design something? So, so that's like design lessons. There's the actual tool you design with, such as your CAD tool. Um, there's where do you put it? How do you find it? What are other people doing? Um, in the mindset of what we do with OSC, it's like, think about it, okay, long-term products across the board for the GVCS. Still the goal is uh, 2028 is uh, my personal uh, cutoff for all the GVCS. Like whatever technology we have at that time, it's time for applications, like much more focus on applications. That means uh, enterprise replication or the things that sprout from it, which initially was... um, what you would call intentional communities but uh, I mean basically re- basically an entrepreneurial way to build to rebuild civilization whether it's like it's a school like right now the model for me that I think could work is the the campus kind of concept where it's like a university it's a mixture of and there's you can read the page called OSC campus on the I think it's a hybrid of like an entrepreneurial eco park uh, a farm, a school, a business, um, but pretty much kind of like what we do here, but you know more organized, which focuses around skills, gaining skills, and applying that to enterprise and respons- responsibility that we take, i.e., in the uh, how do we use our skills in the economy to rebuild, you know, to do things that are done today, but just without hurting others and killing and stealing like we do today. So, um, which is a big call out, I think a university campus-like thing is a well understood thing. Like imagine college, but add to that like a working farm, you got R&D that actually leads to real products, so it's like a slight tweak on the university thing, which that's kind of what they do, except it all gets privatized and to individual companies. That's basically my game plan. I'm likely to just become a professor at a historically mm-hmm. black college. There's about four or five of them that are oh, yeah? agricultural and technical. Oh, yeah. You know, so mm-hmm. Alabama A&M, North Carolina A&M. Oh, yeah. Like that. So that's pretty, I've kind of come to the same conclusion where like, hey, if I was at a university that had an ag and a tech program and I was doing a research, it was open source development and semester by semester there were more open that's really why I want to know all of this because I think in a semester's time I can take a new cohort of open source collaborators and send them out into the world and develop a yeah. lab on a campus and just keep this whole thing going so it gets an exponential growth. So right. Yeah, I mean, imagine you do that and then there's another person, like, for example, Joshua Pierce right now, who's in Canada right now. He, he set up his whole, whole program. It's focused. It's focused on open development. Um, where he now he can get a PhD in open source hardware. I mean that, that's for you right now. But imagine a whole bunch of people like that who are collaborating, and um, all the info is out there in free formats like 
like free cads and open scads and all that they do a lot of their stuff on Appropedia and yeah we, we collaborate with them uh, that's who actually sent us the pellets that we're using right now um, for the filament maker but imagine that where yeah you do get a cohort of people and as long as you can understand okay this is how we document and he's got a whole bunch of stuff on how, how they do that and it's similar it's like wikis and open files that you share and bills of materials and build instructions publishing papers that kind of stuff they're a good paper mill yeah um, they're cranking stuff out and um, they just applied for a grant to get a bunch of equipment from us like actually do the tractor so they could actually um, they I, apparently got some experiment land for experimentation like an acre or a few acres that they're actually working with um, as part of that the deal he struck up with the university so he's you know he's moving forward with the open source hardware development focus which is really cool yeah um, that's uh, the idea is well base well, once again kind of going back well, what's the operational model what's the financial model for that to actually succeed so like take the HBC you might have okay there's tuition people actually students are paying and if there's that kind of direction that can come in and there's multiple entities that do that that can add up to something um, I mean the promise of what patents used to promise which was oh we can actually enhance in innovation by publishing openly well patents don't they give you the concept but a concept is just one of the very um, it's not adequate to actually replicate something uh, but that was actually the original intent that you're actually giving this information to the world in exchange for protection yeah and it's it's kind of gotten a bit corrupted from that kind of notion but yeah it's not a far cry to say that oh yeah we're actually trying to stimulate innovation uh, in a little different way, like you gotta somehow tweak that to to say, oh, uh, we're actually sharing the enterprise that comes out of it. Well, that's distributed enterprise concepts, uh, not very popular yet. But um, I also don't see that how if problems are getting more complex, we've got more technology, more ability to learn, and more powerful, flexible fabrication tools. This kind of open collaboration just is inevitable because people, I think that there is definitely a lot of talk about collaborative development, maybe not, people don't really mean the same thing as we do by that, i.e. they're not going to share their enterprise info, but that notion is certainly well accepted, it's just pushing that to say, oh, well, it actually does mean that we share, and what is the deepest form of sharing, it would be while well, sharing in the economic process, which is very unevenly shared today. Yeah. I mean, I, so I, I, I think we'll inevitably arrive at that, but it's not there yet. Yeah, so I, I have managed research programs for the Department of Energy's Advanced Manufacturing Office, and so this conversation is happening. It's just yeah, yeah. those that open source is a part of the solution. <laughs> so and what do they call it? They're, they're not... I mean, they're still calling it like smart manufacturing and agility you know, like, there's a lot of conversations around, like, oh, COVID and supply chain disruptions, and, you know, like, how do we get more uh, flexibility and resilience and agility out of our manufacturing base here in the U.S.? You know, how do we get in situ measurement in manufacturing processes and find platforms for sharing all of that data mm -hmm. so that, you know, people are, you know, I'm literally writing a report on this right now. But, uh, you know, people are solving a problem in this manufacturing facility. Mm. They're so focused here, they don't realize that a thousand other people have the same issue. And everybody's, yeah. you, know, you know, so everyone's talking about this, but open source isn't a part of that conversation yet, you know. Yeah. Except where I'm subtly, you know, slipping it in the same way I was, like, slipping in DC, you know, uh, electrical distribution five years ago and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, these things, they, they take a long time. Uh, everybody recognizes that these are problems. The manufacturing right. world and even the U.S. government are talking about it and trying to figure out how to fund these sorts of things, but they don't have the right language or the or they haven't. The people who are involved in managing these things have not been exposed to the alternatives for them to even realize that there are other options out there besides the way that they're used to innovation taking place. So that's a good point. Yeah.
And that goes back to a solid revenue model that we can develop, which I right now think is still the CD Eco home. And, and you show that making millions and you say, hey, we actually developed this all collaboratively. It's completely open. You can start an enterprise right now, make this amount of money. Like once they see a few examples like that, that shifts the discussion because right now there is no example like that. There are some that went south, like say MakerBot, that then that would show the world. Oh well, now the only way you can do it is if you go proprietary. Uh, if you're collaborating openly, you got to close it up to make a lot of money. Um, or like Prusa printers right now, which is awesome and open source, but it's like they're not uh, they're not trying to distribute their enterprise model or anything like that. In fact, more towards the opposite, like away from the open ethic. Just like I still uh, still trying to figure this one out where in one of their videos they, they showed how they make filament for their high precision filament and they had the machines actually blanked out for their specs like like proprietary like oh I'm not going to show you like what parameters I'm using or what machine I'm really using like that kind of stuff. So we don't have examples where here's a business, a guy in a government case study oh case study shows this open economics works don't have it it's not there yet but a, a one or a few of those one even a single one that works that's why uh, personally I'm intent on this thing okay we gotta do this you gotta show the cash flow and at that point it becomes obvious and and you have a cascade of further development uh, just cascade of oh cool and People actually see the see the numbers and see the data coming out of that, as far as economic output, and and that's why the essence here is like industrial product of even a small scale, the meeting or exceeding industry standards. That's all part of that game. Um, but we just need good examples, and that cascade can happen. It's around the corner. It's it's close, yes. uh, but just nobody um, cracked that yet. The interesting thing is that the role of government is usually typically to fund things before they become obvious. Right? Yeah. You know, like there's, there's the at least in the Department of Energy, they almost require at this point that if the government funds any software development, it has to be open source. And yeah. So most of the national labs, when they write software to solve some problem, you know, there's usually some open source code that comes out of that, right? Yeah. That's not the case on the hardware side yet. I don't feel like it's a massive shift to be able to make that, and also don't feel like it, the government won't pay attention to it. Right, like they're supposed to fund early stage research. That's like right. part of the mission. So the, I think the big question is how to get, you know, it, basically what I'm trying to say is there should be significant funding from the U.S. government in this type of thing because that's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. So the question is how to bridge that gap because it's a it's a untapped resource. Right, and there's like uh, SBIR grants and things like that. They I hear the, the Department of Energy, there's the Department of Defense, they love, they apparently love open source, like when, when you propose a project there that's open source, they like it, which is good, because I don't know how long that's been that way already, not sure, but at least now. Well, technically since the internet, right? <laughs> <Dark one. laughs> yeah, um, so it sounds like actually some of the government may be quite receptive, um, yeah. Maybe we'll talk, we'll talk about it. Maybe we'll find another time to talk about that because I could get you a Well, not now because everybody's headquarters is still closed because of COVID. But like, if you wanted to do a presentation to like the advanced manufacturing office or something like that, that's pretty easy to set up. And that, at the very least, there are workforce training grant programs and all types of other things. So like opportunities to say, we train people in advanced manufacturing. You know, the, uh, was it, uh, not Enro, the Oak Ridge National Lab in uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, right? Mm -hmm. They had this big manufacturing uh, demonstration facility, the MDF, right? And I've been there, and it's, you know, they got a bunch of big, full metal 3D printers and a whole thing, like, doing 3D printing at scale. None of it is open hardware, though, which is ironic, mm -hmm. because they're a national lab funded by the U.S. government, and if they develop software, it would be open source. Mm -hmm. If they develop hardware, it's not, right? And so, you know, so they're, they're natural points of collaboration, and you know, maybe folks that you could be talking to, uh, people in our community you can be talking to, you know, and resources that are available. So, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to bridge these two mm. things, basically, because, you know, they're not that different. They should be sharing resources. 
What's a place called manufacturing development facility? Uh, demonstration facility. Yeah. Demonstration. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I should definitely uh, be interested in talking there. That's uh, there might be some people that are like, oh wow, they really click. I mean, completely click with it. I mean, you find. I mean, do you find yourself in that environment? Some people that like pretty much completely get it, or not really. Um, it's a lot of academics, so it's still hard. You yeah. Know, <clears throat> You know, they focus on solving problems that they know the government is going to fund in the next round, kind of thing. Mm. And there's a bit of a, there's always detachment from like what's really happening in the world. <laughs> so, mm. yeah, but the, the MDF, they also are overage in general. They work uh, really closely with the University of Tennessee and Knoxville as well. So there's a lot of resources that flow through there that are sort of directed in this area. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So regarding some practical things, what we can cover right now so basic process okay how do we use the wikis and so that that discussion has to start with the development template because all this stuff is about I actually find the documentation aspect to be more important these days because having built a bunch of stuff what I noticed this is how you evolve you, you, first you go out in the workshop spend all your time in the workshop but after a little while, you say, mm, "Man, if I planned this a little more, I didn't have, wouldn't have to do that again." And then you say, "Oh, well, now I actually know enough about the build process to plan it out, to know exactly how I'm going to build that, what tools I'm going to use, what's going to work and what's not." And then you think, "Oh, wow, I got all this experience." And then you say, "Hmm, okay, let's plan. Let's spend more and more time planning because." Planning on paper is cheaper than going out there and potentially getting hurt and getting your fingers chopped off and whatever. So you, um, my personal evolution has been now I would like to spend like either 10 to, or 100 to 1 ratio of design to build. That's kind of what we implement through the extreme manufacturing thing. We're going to say we're going to spend 100 days preparing for a one day build kind of a thing. And that's the reality once you get the experience and I know that initially just like myself I, you know thinking about the first I remember distinctly the old workshop some of the earliest power cubes okay I get in there month of hard work sweating every day publishing videos that's like 2007 or 8 uh, or 9 the, the early days and um, then after a month of hard work okay here's this thing and then I was like always thinking about okay how do you make this better and quicker faster because it's it's really hard work it's it's really hard work so you get the prototype but a prototype is a prototype and you need to go through dozens of them uh, with a metaphor to software being that I mean how, think about how many bugs you have to fix in software it's literally the same thing in hardware it's like you, you make this improvement this improvement and that but all that costs money and time and then you start thinking about okay how do you d design for disassembly Designed for mod modularity, designed for scalability. So you're not just designing one thing, you're designing an ecosystem that one makes your effort much more valuable. So for me, that came out of necessity because, uh, you know, we didn't have people here. So, okay, I'm, I said, if, if I'm going to design this, let me design it in a way that can be the most robust and multi purpose, just a way, as a way to save time. And then at that time, FreeCAD didn't really exist, so we were like trying to hardly do an design work just doing simple simple concept designs but as much as possible like say you look at life track one see those hydraulics diagrams that's all uh, that was all really prior to CAD and then there was there was SketchUp at that time but it's not that great um, but then as time went on knowing that okay now we have uh, parts part libraries uh, techniques that we know then you can start uh, building upon all of that and so over time you start noticing that man if, um, if that kind of knowledge could be built up for more people then this process could explode and that kind of makes it very clear that the documentation is even more important than the builds and that's that's the like the the one learning that I mean wish we can do that better here like right now let's try that 
but you know like when we're working on a on a filament or right now it'll end with this build if we don't if we don't document it naturally um, so the way we can encourage others to do it or or just for the next time that we're clear about how we did it and we remember because I mean once you build it you know if time passes by you forget everything that you did so you got to document to take the pictures and all that but there's I mean there's a standard product development methodology that we're not inventing anything there's you, you look at product development uh, Google that and then think of open so then Google open source product development and um, then you actually you know you're in trouble because it gets us to our wiki so that means that <laughs> that means that we're like ahead of the game because there's no other stuff talking about open source product development and but if you read the literature and it's on the open source product development page read some of those seminal papers and they actually talk about collaborative open is the next phase that development will take on but they still use the same kind of process. You got to go through all the due diligence steps of what you do to develop, and that's simply captured in the development template. So the critical page to, to do on a wiki is called development template. Um, so if you haven't taken a look at that, do take a look at it. But right now, um, development template. So basically, using wikis, common tools. To do documentation first we use like this embedded uh, Google spreadsheet but right now it's just a simple uh, template that we have in the wiki where yeah the concept there being yeah so let's uh, I think that should turn on is that plugged in yeah um, the important concept there is, okay, here's a wiki, here's a tool that's an infinite, infinitely scalable database. Use it. There's templates within the wiki. You can pre-program a template and call it up within a, with a single word in double brackets, in the curly brackets. Uh, so, for example, the, the whole development process, is, it's called template dev plus. So you do the curly bracket, dev plus and then pipe in okay what's the name of the project so there's a whole other topic about nomenclature and taxonomy but you start a project like the OSC filament maker uh, so if you go to say OSC click on my logs so once again logs is how you find out what other people are doing and you can look at work log on the wiki but if you look at um, my logs say OSC filament maker you'll see this whole thing that's formatted to sh to take you to help you guide guide you through Are you on oh yeah so let's zoom it up so do you guys got the new link Yeah, um, but that's a template dev. So that's that's the actual template. Well, let's talk about it. So, so the wiki allows you to easily call up one of these things. If you know this thing that exists, which is called Dev Plus, it's just a template for the standard development that we do. You call it up in one line; it takes you a second. So it's like cloning a project on GitHub, forking it something. You you download the whole. Um, the whole thing from what you start building on it here it's a little different because it seeds it but it seeds it with blank pages for what you've got uh, working on but you have to treat it as a fork treat every build as a fork because you're going to do things differently so we encourage that the main thing is we're building this filament maker now uh, we got to start a new development page don't try to put anything back into the filament maker from 2018 or whatever 
because it's going to start jumbling everything up. Let's see. Let's see. Do we have, do we this? have this? No. no. Um, let me share share that screen here. Oh. So this is, um, so how do you document everything on this? Uh, so this is the development play template by putting in a single word into the wiki edit. So, so go to the wiki, say uh, test, test page, right? So how do you call up this? I just started a page called test page. How do you call up, how do you start development? Say you want to work on um, whatever. Whatever you got, you got, you want to develop a 3D printable fitting uh, or a manual. What do you want to develop? You want to build, what do you want to start development on? Um, okay, so we do Dev Plus, which is the template. So look at the screen. I'm just typing in. I don't know where the sound is coming from. Muted, I've switched my off my uh, uh, maybe let's see if we go the volume down on this thing no, uh, volume zero on that so this is what I'm doing so I'm editing the wiki the double bracket dev plus dev plus is a template how do you know what the template well point is you can create a template by by calling up so um, we can start a template this is useful template uh, my template start a template called my template I mean when you do something like this when you create it then whatever you named it that will be whatever now I create here, that will be your template. So, and you can do whatever kind of crazy formatting and all that. Um, but the point is you can create templates to which with one word you can call up and make you display anything such as this test page here, development plus called Emmanuel's uh, hot controller. So look what happened. I just did that one page and it's and it gave me all this, all the development process, including this info box and all that, because that's what was already put in there. Now there are some links here which talk about there's a description column and it takes you the development process takes you through the standard steps of development. There's design. There's which starts with concept. Then there's actual technical design build materials build and life cycle design which is more like data collection future work um, kind of like you can call that like da data collection points but this is nothing new this is um, somewhat of a standard way like if you design something for a company you're gonna start with requirements and things like that oh uh, and you gotta document all of that and the way um, for parallel development, what's I think useful to note here that um, a lot of these steps, well, okay, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, there's a lot that you can start documenting um, in a collaborative way because, well, because a lot of these things reinforce one another. So, for example, if you start with a requirement, um, I, I actually make this let's let's start with a limit like the in the limit of infinity statement which says um, like think about uh, I like to do things such as thinking about the extreme case of a something to get insight so here uh, to give you an example if you think about the development template it should be such that any one of the elements here would almost be like in it's fully developed 
iteration would literally give you all the information you need to actually build something or design something like if you had a complete exhaustive limit of infinity requirement and value proposition then that would be equivalent to your 3d cat even like so for example if you said the requirement is that in your 3d cad you can only use these uh, parts that are such and such in other words the descriptiveness of each step is so redundant that if you were to do the full job of documenting you'd be able to extract like all the other steps from it uh, does that make sense yeah, right. because <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, so you just said it like, yeah, then you look at industry standards and you might say, oh, well, there's all this stuff we're already building on. So altogether, this is not something that's starting from scratch. You can be building upon this whole vast pool of knowledge. And this is the time binding concept that we're building upon all the stuff that already exists. So when you're stuck with this flat, this th whole empty thing, which is red means empty. And you're like, oh, where do I start? Well, start with all of human history and, and see where you end up um, so now, going so, with it. So now my question, now if I go on the wiki right now and I type in the search for hot controller, this page doesn't come up. So I think part of the issue is, like, it doesn't? unless you know the wiki, it's hard to find, like I didn't know that the filament maker was called alignment, right? It was almost impossible to find stuff on the filament maker that was relevant, right? So it's like, so the question then is like, how do you even know oh, good question. or how to get to it? Yeah. Right. So now that, that's like, because we're, we don't know what we're doing on a wiki here. Like the search box there, there's an other type of a search where you actually would see it. But in lieu of that, so this is like, we need to update the wiki is, is one thing. So if you don't know what something is called, then you have to go look at the taxonomy page and see, okay, what are things called here? How do we develop here? So you would go to taxonomy. But if you know that other people are working on it, then you can look at their logs and see if you can extract that. If you didn't know it was the Lyman, you might go back to, um, see, I don't know. I don't know how you'd find it because but we do know some things. We do know that we're working on 50 machines. We do know that also those machines are made up of components, like 500 different components. Have you seen this page? Wait, uh, do you know what all the 500 components are? Yeah, they're right there in the 500. Um, <clears throat> are we using where is that? that are now part of the 500? Yeah, there, <clears throat> there's, um, under module-based design, that's, you know, take a look at that. We know we've got a bunch of machines, each of them are based on modules, each of them have the 40 development steps or so of the development template. Um... So why don't you search for 500 modules? Because clearly the GVC has made up 50 machines and 500 modules. <clears throat> so here's a starting list, but I'm trying to. Think it's possible. Yeah, I think it is. You can, you you would have to grade this. So there's a bunch of stuff here that uh, this is by no way, no means complete. But um, there's a bunch of areas like. 50, you know, about 50 different areas like fittings, 3D printing, high tech, materials, ceramics, well, pneumatics, so hydraulics. So that's not necessarily 50. That many parts, like part, it may be more. It's like if you think about like 50 GVCS machines, the requirement there for the 500 parts would be that the 50, you can take the 500 and make any of the 50 with it. So you try to get to the, the pattern language of what all technology is made of. And then you have to say, okay, well, these are the main components. You can grade them and you can say that these are the most common elements that exist, like a ball bearing would definitely be in there. Um, 
or a hydraulic motor, maybe electric motor, solenoid, but those, those microcontroller. Are composed of other parts, right? Yeah, and so you can go infinitely down the rabbit hole, so you have to stop somewhere. But then again, you stop at number uh, slightly over a hundred with all the elements too. You know, there's only like a hundred or so elements. But you have to make a judgment saying, okay, these are the most common parts. It's very useful to do that and use, use somewhat of a visual design language. And we have that under the open source technology pattern language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which you can start thinking about how do you synthesize uh, all these different machines, that things that look completely different. But once you start looking under the hood, you start finding that, hey, there's only so many different things. And a long time ago, I drew up this stuff like, linear motors, wheels, rotors, um, frames, uh, yeah, so what, things what like this, but... Though, in like, uh, I mean, there's got to be some difficulty in a universal visual language. Um, yeah, it's, it would take a rigorous set of PhD theses to <laughs> try to define what that would really mean, um, but it would be quite useful, like, what's a good example of where we see it works, like maybe Legos, where you've got these Lego blocks that build all these kinds of things, but Try to get to a set of interchangeable parts, and that's what standards try to do, like ISO standards or standards for, like, this is a bolt, this is how the threads look. Um, there could be a lot of that to reduce the complexity from thousands of different iterations, which a lot of people say, well, that's kind of, I want that, I want a thousand different hubcaps, but uh, you might say, well, altogether that creates a lot of a lot of effort, like do you want to be creating gearhead people who are just doing that or do you want to spend more time on other things? So I think there's a usefulness call out knowing that right now everybody's not provided for. Let's try to make an easy way that everyone could be provided for with abundance. Uh, therefore we might want to rethink how we do technology to make it more appropriate and fixable and accessible. Uh, but what would those, what would the basic it's like an exercise of rebuilding civilization. Um, that one book, like, what's that one book by that English guy? Um, it's called, um, whatever, The Great Reset or something? No, it's this one book that talks about, well, what are the, like, the most basic processes in, in technology that are required to make just about everything? And uh, you can do well to start identifying, like, what is that, like a steel mill? Well, maybe that's just like, electricity, arc furnaces, or a flame, a rock burning, like coal burning and, and melting, you know, melting ores, melting rocks into their, smelting them into their ad elements like iron and stuff like that. But there's like only so much that's out there because all of reality is made of like biomass, ceramic, metal, uh, plastic. Well, that's what I can see. And, and so on and so on, but that you can classify things and it is useful to classify and organize things so that you can actually start treating it as a building block construction set and that's kind of the essence of the Global Village construction set. Let's try to identify some of these basic things that can be used for many things. Um, uh, so, so jump yeah. back into this now because like, okay, so I go on the main page, I see wiki instructions, I click wiki instructions, I do a control F and I try to find taxonomy it's not there. So again, it's just like, I guess part of the issue I have with the wikis, unless I knew that there was a wiki taxonomy page, I'm not sure how to do it. I feel like I have to pre... Yeah. You know, I have to already know what I'm looking for in order to find... Wiki, right? Yeah, that's a bug. And that would be... Um, well, for taxonomy, like a whole bunch of... It does come up. You get a whole bunch of the, these things. No, I'm, I'm saying that like, mm. if, if I'm just getting... To the, if I'm a random contributor who says, oh wow, this open source ecology project looks really cool. Oh, they have a wiki, this is great. And then I come to the wiki and I'm on the home page, wiki.opensourceecology.org. And it's like, oh wow, I want to learn how to navigate this thing. On the left hand side, I see wiki instructions. So I click on wiki instructions and there's nothing there about taxonomy. Right, so that's what I'm saying. It's like, if I'm just being confronted yeah. with this, it's very difficult to even understand what is on the wiki or how to find things on the wiki. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, in conversation, you're like, oh, yeah, go to the wiki taxonomy page. I would have never known that that was a page that existed. You know, so it's like, mm -hmm. even like the site map, 
doesn't help me to find these things. So it's like it's I'm trying to figure out effectively how to navigate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, as opposed to just like ask Martin and he'll tell you there's a page on the wiki that has all the information that you're looking for. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and this gets to, to the idea of well like yeah, you need a whole management team to, to develop that kind of collaboration, like uh, Wikipedia spends $30 million to do that per year. But here I just added Wiki Taxonomy to the, to the Wiki Instructions page. <laughs> but the thing is that, that it's like part of the collaborative literacy is like, okay, well, we're all, this is just a wild thing that lives out there. You can feel free to put any kind of indexical environment that suits you, use your work log. So it's, it's a completely wild thing. Uh, it's a data, it's, you can think of it as a database dump, and yes, it may not be navigable, but that, that's okay, it can, that can come with time too, but it requires, once again, that there's like ongoing continuous effort and teams and stuff like that, and that comes from, uh, once again, the revenue models and people being supported by this so that they don't just pop in, because it is overwhelming to study everything, you have to be engrossed in it with some very significant motivation like making a living or something like that. Okay, so um, I so an account if I want to have a role? Yeah, if you don't have an account you just uh, go up to yeah if you if I log out <clears throat> I would go request account then you can start editing it but the whole thing like the first thing just to for people to understand what a wiki is it's I think a lot of people don't even understand this concept that oh you could actually completely just log in and start editing this public piece of work. Um, that's that's a big deal too. Like a lot of people don't know such a thing is even an animal. It, it exists. Um, how many people know that actually on the planet right now? I mean, the internet's been around for a few years, but a lot of people don't know it. But that is possible. But it's part of the learning curve. A hundred million. Mm -hmm. You'd say hundred million? No. Maybe like out of like, yeah. So it's like a couple of percent, a few percent. Yeah, most people are editors. Yeah, yeah, and it's a different way of thinking because, because uh, a lot of people come to me like like uh, treating me like I'm the master of that, and I, I you know, I uh, kind of control every single page, but I don't. It's like I'm one of the editors. How many current editors are there? Not too many, but you let's see. Data. Let's look at. Can I, is there a way to see the data, like particularly how many visit, how many visitors are on it? Go to pages. Like a thousand people visited this page over this time period. Yeah, there are stats like, um, uh, for example, active users lists. So right now, there's only like two, four, six, eight, ten people uh, editing, uh, and me, I'm, I've got. 517 actions so I'm like a majority editor there's Eric who's got like a hundred I'm in third <laughs> now for there are some more special pages like stats wiki statistics um, where is that things we do see is there's 11 almost 12 thousand pages content pages um, 16,000 files there's like 2,000 registered users active users are 15 um, that's, that's kind of the well, what about uh, visits to a particular page yeah do we track that that um, That would be like really helpful data. Yeah, there is. It is here somewhere. Let's see. Um, where is that?
yeah. Um, how do I see that? Like, for example, how do I know there's a page called Cost of Living that was pretty popular? But how do I find that out? Oh, yeah, page information. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, look at uh, any page and look at page information. Do you guys see that or is that an admin okay. feature? It doesn't really. But don't I have like no, it doesn't even tell you stats. Yeah, we should be tracking all of this. It's like it's PH. Someone who knows PHP can upgrade this wiki. Uh, we were hoping that Joshua would uh, get to this at some point, but he disappeared. He went AWOL. Um, left tab is bottom of the tools in the left tab. What, what's useful is things like what links here. Um, there's a bunch of useful pages in, under special pages. But what, what the way to navigate this is look at recent wiki changes and then you know kind of like what's happening. So someone will ask, um, is anything going on? Well, take a look at recent changes. And is anything happening? Well, yeah, you know, 22 October, there's a few edits. I mean, the year there is 2021, it's not like 2011 or something, so you know it's active, and you can look at all the, all the recent changes. So, if you know that you're working on a team, it's useful to look at, like, say you're collaborating, well, one thing is the work log, like Martian log, or Ken log or something, and if you know who the team is, like if we know we've got the team here, then we'd want to, if someone said, um, I just got a new design on this thing. Uh, okay, that's it. Okay, that means I would look at your log and I look at the CAD file. Okay, did you upload a free CAD file? Let me see it. Um, that's the kind of way to communicate. So implicitly, you know that stuff is happening. There's part libraries on the wiki where, like for example, for the CNC torch table, there's a gallery of parts we're already using. Um, Uh, genealogies page is very useful so because this is like thinking about long-term evolution of projects so actually like main navigation tools like genealogies development template work log recent changes but here like if you think we did something on a printer well you can find everything that we did on a printer by 3d printer genealogy It'll take you to all the different printers we've built, and including um, 2106. We don't even have the Mega here, which is the large one, or Giga, rather. Um, so if you're working on a torch table, you're trying to find out, okay, like say, you know, we're working on a torch table, I would go, the first thing is genealogy. It should be there. It should be the 21.08. Because you might think, well, what do we name it? Well, we're just doing a simple year, Ubuntu style, like year and month kind of a thing, which is very useful because there's one, there's so many projects, and it helps you identify it more, more by chronology. But like on the CAD there, you've got, okay, that's the parts we're working with. There's the the this thing for example that's actually already up there uh, if you know what that is so that's already up there um, free cut files there um, so but at the end of the day like what's what's some of the key metrics we look for well um, number of wiki edits like on your work log, finding FreeCAD files. I mean, that's like the ultimate thing. Like if we talk about any design, like su such as the filament maker right now, the bottom line is, okay, do we have a design that we're digitizing? That's the FreeCAD file uh, so that anyone else can build upon it. Or 10 years from now, we make a, you know, evolution of it or whatever, or somebody across the world can actually right now get involved in it. But once again, the issue is 
uh, the findability, like getting people to show up, as I always say, uh, enough people that ha that have to understand the idea that, okay, collaboratively, if only a very small percentage of the world's population actually did work on this, I mean, we would have this done in no time. Um, but that's a huge organizational challenge that's very costly and it would be really good to be able to execute on that because how do you get so many people to collaborate when most of the world doesn't even know that there's even a technical capacity to collaborate like this or the mindset to do so or, or the tools and processes or the concept of here's the standard product development methodology um, yeah so it's a it's a complex package and it, uh, yeah. I think companies are gonna what I envision in the future is definitely companies that are coming to a common pool of of designs and collaborating on their products um, I do think that's that's gonna happen more and more uh, because it's efficient like at the end of the day if you can systematize these processes um, end of the day you don't want it's about not reinventing the wheel if you can find something that's been done before you're not reinventing the wheel but right now unfortunately reinventing the wheel is, is the standard that happens like Emmanuel you mentioned the, the one government company or one company does this you know 100 other universities are working on the same thing might not necessarily know it yeah so um, millions of grad students around the world doing the same experiments and failing because only the successes get published in academic journals. Right. <laughs> yeah. Things like that. So we were talking about like uh, this uh, the ratio of design to, to yeah. and uh, so I'm curious about like uh, and, you know, I'm looking up there are some tools out here, but we have talked about like finite element analysis and yeah. you know, uh, extensions to Yeah, I mean, there's free cat finite element analysis, uh, free cat, there's structural analysis you can do. Skeptical free cat has the capability to do any serious simulation of the world. Why is that? Because it it has problems even just rendering as a, an, a some more complex objects, and so it, it, because a lot of the underlying source code is not the best. Or it's, it uses Python for a huge amount of the code base, so it's slow, um, and simulating the physical world takes a lot of either computation power or a really efficient software. Mm. That's why I, th I think that. Looks like there's a program called Elmer There's a ton of... FEA other software um, Calculix, Codaster, OpenFEM, FML, Elmer FreeCAD is actually borrowing some of this I think it uses Calculix for a lot of stuff it uses open foam, there's open foam F-O-A-M for fluids um, Okay, so people have integrated these into FreeCAD. Yeah, so the point is, once again, it goes back to the nature of the open source tool named FreeCAD, which is that all these additions can be made and integrations and so forth. So there's uh, the expandability there is really powerful. Like imagine there was you know, the next 1,000 PhD theses developing all these modules for FreeCAD, and now you have the best software analysis tool in the world. So... I mean that's that's the p potential and and I think it's if you look at how FreeCAD is growing I mean and there's indication that that's that's kind of happening and there's I mean the communities the project's pretty much exploding these days in terms of the number of people using it market share is almost not noticeable but like when I was ordering parts I emailed the guys hey are you gonna have uh, do you have any FreeCAD files and they said oh actually we're working on that 
for like a supplier that now is starting to provide actual free cat files and stuff like cool. that. So it's a matter of time That's really before. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, already you can get uh, step files are importable into FreeCAD. So like for example, McMaster car, any part there pretty much has has CAD and step format. We just import into FreeCAD. But yeah, um, like Open Foam is there, <clears throat> which is fully open source uh, for all kinds of fluid. You know, your race car. Is this real time or? Um, I don't real time, but. And then there's even things like this one PhD guy from Greece is working on windmill electromagnetic uh, windmill. I know it's Costas, so um, uh, uh, windmill But there's like there's all kinds of stuff coming out, and that once again that's the essence of the open source nature that uh, things are coming out that are made accessible to all. It seems that if you think about it, that kind of builds, uh, kind of accretes mass, unlike proprietary packages where, I mean, some people are actively saying, well, we can't do that because it costs so much to get the license. Here, if you've got free access, potentially there's more and more people using it. That's, I think that's the trend that's uh, that's happening. And there's critiques like whatever, like the original code base for FreeCAD may not be sufficient. I mean, for right now, whatever we do, it's sufficient. Um, and it could be rewritten completely in the future, too. So. Yeah, but the main thing is on the wiki to start uploading like the, the real, like the badge of honor here. It's like, okay, really, how many files are you actually contributing that other people can use, build upon? And are they just files or are they tested files, things that you actually build? Because if you build it, that has a whole level of merit that says, oh, it's actually, it's not just a design from out of nowhere it's actually been tested and that becomes valuable because then other people gain trust in it and are motivated to build upon it more so if you want to contribute like in the long term to the project the the ultimate is how many files of things that are buildable or have been built and even starting with the files because a file even if it's not buildable someone who knows about buildability can improve it and and so forth. So, um, the number of FreeCAD files that actually are downloadable, better yet, organized into as parts of other part libraries. So, what part libraries do we really have already? There's a whole bunch of them. Like, we have FullCAD of the open source BioDigester, for example. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, I mean, the CD Home part library is huge. All kinds of libraries there. For the tractor, oh, we had one from the Lyman Filament Maker. Yeah, a bunch of stuff is there. Um, and the usefulness of part libraries here, like imagine you're looking for parts because you're trying to design something and you're trying to actually find the real part. The, that's the real thing. Like when you do the CAD, it's one thing when you just put in a placeholder versus a part that's completely geometrically correct and even if approximately but like it has the critical features so it doesn't have to be a huge file it just has to have some critical features 
that now he can really work with it and analyze things like, oh, well, can things actually be put together? Um, how much space it takes? What else can I attach to it? Things like that. You can work a lot of that stuff out in CAD. So once people get savvy in CAD, um, one, not only are you starting to create meaningful design, and that comes from using meaningful parts, but then also others can build upon it and the process can start snowballing. But at the simplest level, just the access to the basic parts like, okay, I want to do that uh, filament maker. Uh, where's the file of the heater band or the, the plug that goes in the end of it that are actual real parts that we use that can help us um, do the real design? Because at the end of the day, you want to get yourself trained to the point of when you see something, like, is it a real design that's buildable? Or is it just a concept? Because sometimes you might see some amazing CAD, but it's not super buildable. Um, in fact, um, actually, look at like architecture. Like I, for a long time, I didn't know what architects do, and I, I kind of still don't. But um, no, but architects actually don't design houses. They design house concepts. Like they don't do the technical stuff. The technical stuff is implemented by the people who actually build it. But they do draw up things like some um, finished detail, like, okay, this is how like a little wall section looks and stuff like that, so the builder can get, get to building it. But they don't actually do the full technical model, uh, which I didn't know. It's a useful insight um, because if you can do the actual full CAD to, down to like buildability, and ease and maintenance, that's a whole different game than just a, a concept. And in terms of price and executability, um, and part of the reason why we think we can do the house so much more lower cost is because it's not a concept design, it's like fully technical with information in our consideration of how you're actually building it. So we're not leaving anything to chain, chance, rather. Um, being in tight control of the product, you can actually control the cost and, and what the business model that comes out of it. And that, that's very important if you're going to take this to the level of here's a viable economic enterprise to make it happen. So you'll find a lot of CAD out there in GrabCAD. Like GrabCAD is really good for like a lot of concept stuff, but like buildability, I don't know. Uh, it takes this very special skill set to, to design something that's and it's a rare skill set. I don't see it a lot at all. Uh, where you're designing something that's buildable, easy to build, and all that. Because typically different people do those different st steps, and it's a disintegrated process. Um, which implies that, okay, there's these huge efficiencies that can be gained because you can consider the whole chain of production. Um, that's the kind of thinking we like to have here in, in an integrated approach. Um, okay, so workshop stuff. Let's switch switch gears a little bit. 